Hey class, it's Mr. Hofstede here, and we are starting off our sixth and final unit. Yay! Way to go for sticking through this distance learning. I'm really proud of you guys who've made it all the way here. The end is so near. You can do it. This is my personal favorite unit of all of Physics 20. It's a good one. I hope you enjoy it too. Uh, this first lesson is going to have a lot of vocab and conceptual stuff that might be a little bit challenging at first, but I really encourage you to put in some extra work into figuring it out, understanding it, because uh, this is definitely the foundation for the remainder of this unit. Uh, bigger unit again, nine lessons, just like unit five. Uh, this first lesson is one of the longer ones, but uh, our second and third ones are going to be shorter to make up for that. So let's get into harmonic motion, which is also known as simple harmonic motion, which is what we're going to be referencing quite often, especially in the first half of this unit, and then mechanical waves. So as always, we got our cartoons. When will we be breaking the sound barrier? Oh, if only it worked like that. That's not even a crying baby. That's a temper tantrum. I don't even know. He looks like a teenager almost. Why is he crying? Who knows? But we'll find out that uh, in, I think, possibly even our last lesson, you uh, actually, by breaking the sound barrier, wouldn't avoid this screaming because of the Doppler effect and relativity. Finally, we got... Uh, rocket launching in a technological breakthrough that revolutionized the space industry NASA successfully launches the first space shuttle mission to be activated by the clapper clap on clap off light switches I don't know if you guys remember those but yes we have a clap on clap off rocket launch doesn't seem like the best or most necessary technology but Anyways, let's get into it. Our first one is the kinematics and dynamics of simple harmonic motion. So whenever you see SHM from here on out, we know that we're talking about simple harmonic motion. And it's a very specific kind of motion, just like uniform circular motion. Uh, it's not uniform circular motion. It has some similarities, I guess you could say. Uh, We'll get down to it shortly. So we all know what waves are, right, from the ocean. We probably have heard of sound waves, radio waves, microwaves. Waves are all around us. Some physicists even think that everything in life is waves. So let's kind of come up with our Physics 20 working definition of what waves and vibration are. So... As we know, energy can be transferred from one place to another by moving an object, right? That's back to unit four. That's essentially doing work on a ball, right? We're transferring energy. So you can have this as a ball thrown from one baseball player to another, right? We're converting potential energy stored in the baseball player to uh, maybe elastic energy in his arm and kinetic energy in the ball and as it moves through the air right we're maintaining that kinetic energy until the other player catches it so we don't always need to have this physical contact to transfer energy we can actually almost telepathically not quite but kind of some similarities we can transfer energy without the object moving from the source to the receiver so we don't need the physical objects to be moved. We can actually transfer energy through a wave. So that's pretty neat and exciting. It was groundbreaking when it was discovered, for sure. So what is a wave? It's a transfer of energy, not matter, from source to receiver. So even a wave in the ocean, you're not moving the matter from the far off depths of the ocean to the shore all that's happening really is the water molecules are moving up and down as the wave passes through and the energy is being transferred across the ocean so a traveling 
disturbance in a medium is another way we can talk about a wave right it could be a disturbance in water like a wave it could be a disturbance in the air like a sound wave uh, so those two different mediums would be water and air but a medium is whatever the the wave is traveling through so it could even be a desk right if you knock on wood you're sending uh, a wave through that uh, desk as vibrations and those vibrations are actually disturbing the air which is why we hear it the sound waves so this is all very important stuff I'll attach some extra YouTube videos to deepen your understanding of these because this understanding of a wave will come up again and again and it's not all that intuitive the idea of transferring just energy right the matter not actually technically moving from source to receiver right and this idea of mediums is going to be very important so we have two types of waves we have mechanical waves which is what we focus on in physics 20 and then we have electromagnetic waves which is what we call light uh, and that's studied well not just light there's a whole spectrum of this anything from uh, gamma rays super powerful super short wavelength all the way to our radio waves or visible light and down to uh, yeah ultraviolet we've got a whole spectrum right light ultraviolet x-rays but that's going to come up in physics 30 if you are planning on taking physics 30 it's a big huge portion of that entire course and it's very interesting you'll be uh, pretty boggled when it comes to electromagnetic waves and it's very fun in my mind hopefully you as you as well so this is what we are focusing on now in physics 20 mechanical waves you won't hear talk about electromagnetic waves for a while mechanical waves are any waves that travel through matter so that's this notion of a medium right uh, matter is disturbed so we have vibrations whether that's the water in the ocean or the air molecules uh, for sound waves uh, but the matter doesn't move with the wave so here's a, a unique one we got springs so if we were in class I could do a nice demo with springs maybe I'll get a video out to you of that similar but you can actually send waves down springs or taut strings nice and tight strings right we also have water if you topple dominoes that's a really good one the dominoes aren't physically moving from start to finish when you make a really long train of dominoes and topple them over the dominoes are staying where they are but they're transferring energy down the line as they fall and knock the one beside it over right they are moving a little bit but they're not moving from the source or the start to the receiver or the finish just like sound waves the air particles are staying uh, in relatively the same spot they're just vibrating back and forth uh, and that's also happening with earthquakes so that's a, an important idea about mechanical waves they need to travel through matter those are the options or some of the options and in it the matter is disturbed but doesn't move along with the wave right and our cool exception for EMR this is electromagnetic radiation uh, that we're going to focus on in physics 30 is that these type of waves don't need a medium they can travel through a vacuum so that's kind of the only piece that you're going to uh, need to have in mind for physics 20 that mechanical waves which we're focusing on need a medium electromagnetic don't they can travel through a vacuum all right so this idea of matter being vibrated or disturbed is very important we'll kind of look into uh, this idea this vocabulary here so a vibration will always be the source of a wave even EMR electromagnetic radiation or electromagnetic waves so in sound we have kind of vibrating guitar strings vocal cords vibrating particles in a desk as I knock on it and 
uh, those vibrations are going to right move back and forth and actually vibrate the air particles near them and the air particles are going to vibrate other air particles nearby them and it's going to have that domino effect water right if we drop a stone into a pond it'll have those nice ripples spreading out uh, so that initial contact between the rock and the pond the water is going to create that vibration in the surface of the water right it's going to hit the water right kind of form that little dish and then the water is going to return back up react right opposite reaction to the stone and then that's going to send out these waves in each direction so the source vibration determines two qualities of the wave. This is super interesting, super important to remember, and honestly, very hard to fully comprehend. You almost have to take this as one of the weird truths of nature and physics. So the source vibration will determine the initial energy of the wave. So we'll find out shortly that energy is related to a specific part of the wave and that's going to always be determined by that first vibration that's why if you pluck a guitar string really hard you're going to have a loud sound with lots of energy if you pluck it really quietly that initial vibration is a lot smaller you're going to be transferring a lot less energy through the air so that initial energy is determined by the source vibration and this is the crazy part the frequency of the wave is determined not only by the source vibration but it will stay the same for the entirety of that wave's existence so we do need to know what frequency is before we can really comprehend how neat and exceptional this is but this is going to be an extremely important part it's going to be really easy to forget because it isn't all that intuitive but uh, the frequency of the source is the frequency of the wave produced, and that will uh, never change. It'll always be the frequency of that wave. So it's almost like the fingerprint of the wave, you could think of it, and throughout that life of the wave as it travels either through the water or through the air, or whatever medium it's in, it's not going to change, right? Just like your fingerprints don't change, I think. Who knows? Unless you sand them off with sandpaper or get a big cut so even if there's friction even if you're changing medium from water to air or from air to uh, some solid material whatever happens to that wave externally can't change this frequency of it All right and frequency is kind of like how often it's traveling up and down right or the spacing between the different waves. We'll get more into that soon. Uh, and also, once the wave is created, it'll never change because we assume that the source and receiver are stationary. So uh, the last lesson, we'll talk about the Doppler effect, and that's kind of an exception having to do with relativity. So doesn't matter what you do to the wave, as long as you're both stationary, the frequency of the wave will never change. All right, let's get down into some math. So this whole first page is a whole bunch of conceptual stuff that's going to be very foundational. So don't just ignore it because there's no math. Uh, really study that and try your best to internalize that and make sense of it. So mathematics, this is what most of us like. This is the, the part that we're here for. So a vibration is an example of periodic motion which is a motion that repeats itself over and over again right so periodic motion has to repeat itself over and over right and the most simple way of thinking of that is a vibration anything right vibrating up and down left and right however you want to think about it we've got a vibration that is an example of this periodic motion most vibrations are usually so fast that they are heard that they're hard to observe or analyze, right? So you can't really see a guitar string. It'll look a little fuzzy when it's 
vibrating like it's buzzing but you can't really see because it's going so fast up and down however the motion of the pendulum and the motion of a mass hung on a vertical spring are much slower and easier to analyze so we're going to look at those right so here's our two easy to analyze easy to conceptualize things You've got a mass on a spring that's kind of bouncing up and down stretching and compressing the spring or a pendulum rocking back and forth uh, so here's our uh, periodic motion vocabulary we've got a cycle and amplitude so a cycle is one full repetition of the periodic motion right so it's really important that it has to be a full repetition because they are passing through this center point twice in a cycle so a full cycle means it has to go down come back to where it started at the equilibrium go all the way up and come back down to where it started and it's right at this point about to begin going down again so if you're new to this it might be easy to think that this is one cycle here right because we're back to where we started but the truth is that's not a full cycle because we're beginning our motion up and in order for it to be undergoing a full cycle or have gone a full cycle it needs to be traveling in the same direction that it started as well right so here we start at equilibrium we begin traveling down we're going to come back through equilibrium but traveling up so we haven't gone through a full cycle we're going to reach our maximum compression the top of our swing or our vibration or our cycle and then we're going to come down and at this point we're back at equilibrium which is where we started and we're traveling in the same direction that we started so that's an important criteria something that we need to keep in mind and always check for when we're doing these types of questions are we headed in the same direction and are we in the starting position that's when we know we've gone through a full cycle so a cycle is one full repetition and the amplitude is the distance from the equilibrium so our rest point so the amplitude is always a distance from rest equilibrium to maximum displacement right so we can have maximum displacement down we can have maximum displacement up here we can have maximum displacement right to the left to the right both of those displacements or distances are the uh, amplitude right the measurement from equilibrium to our maximum point of compression extension or right swinging so I'll kind of just write this in here this is almost analogous to our X that we went over in uh, unit 3 with our springs right the distance from equilibrium so it'd be our maximum displacement from equilibrium. And it also importantly represents the energy of the vibration. So the more amplitude it has, the more energy that vibration is going to be transferring through the medium. So whenever you're talking about energy of a wave or of an oscillation, or a vibration the energy is always related to this amplitude the distance from equilibrium to the max height uh, and if we're looking at a spring right a cycle if it's starting let's say up to the left here it's going to drop down right come up to the right past equilibrium go back past equilibrium and up to the left now we're back where we started and we're about to travel right so that's when we have a full cycle it has to go there and back that's really key just like our spring had to go there and back so frequency we talked about this uh, we didn't know what it meant now we will figure it out the frequency of a vibration always lowercase f is the number of cycles in one second so if in one second we're doing this 
one time. Then our frequency is one cycle per second, which would be one hertz. Right? If we're doing this up and down 20 times in one second, if it's going really fast, that would be 20 hertz. And that's not even really fast. When we start looking at uh, EMR, electromagnetic radiation, we can get towards yeah a million cycles per second or even upwards of that. So how many times it's undergoing a cycle or an oscillation or a repetition? These are all important words that mean the same thing. Cycle, oscillation, repetition. So number of those vibrations, repetitions in one second is your frequency and our standard unit, a new one for us, going to be very important throughout this unit is a hertz, where one hertz is one cycle per second. So if we break it into a standard unit, we get one over s, right? Or yeah, one cycle per second, one over s. There's no standard unit for a cycle. So our si units for hertz would be uh, inverse second. Period of vibration, so we got capital T, we've looked at period uh, before. So a period is the time it takes for one cycle, right? So it's actually just the flip of frequency. It's how long it takes to do a cycle. Total time divided by total number of cycles. So you can look at this for one cycle. You can look at this for 20 cycles. This is still the formula you're going to use. So if you're just looking at one cycle, that would be the time for, for a cycle divided by the cycle. And this one, easily enough, is just seconds. right? And since their units are reciprocals of each other, that means, well, not always, but in this case, that means that uh, frequency and period are reciprocals of each other. So this formula is going to be used a lot, a lot, a lot. Make sure you're familiar with it and how to switch between frequency and period. So if you're ever given frequency in a question and your formula or the answer you're looking for includes period, you'll just need to take that frequency uh, and go one divided by that frequency, right? And similar with period, if you're given period, want to find frequency, one divided by that period will give you frequency. And this is actually the first formula on our formula sheet under waves and simple harmonic motion. So top right hand side of our formula sheet, we have this new section for our unit, waves and simple harmonic motion. That first one is frequency is equal to one over period. All right, and you could easily change that to uh, by multiplying by period to both sides, dividing by frequency we can get our period is equal to one over frequency. You can add that in if you so choose, if you can see it. Yes, there we go. All right, so they're both reciprocals of each other, which means all you have to do is take the value of one and divide it by, or one divided by itself, and you get the other. All right, simple harmonic motion. This is an important and unique type of motion that will only occur in an ideal world with an ideal spring or an ideal elastic or whatever it is. Uh, but we use it to simplify the math and apply it to real world things as well. So simple harmonic motion occurs when a perfectly elastic material, like an ideal spring, undergoes vibration and the amplitude remains constant. So we need to have this perfect spring vibrating with a constant amplitude, and that would, uh, by definition, keep vibrating with that amplitude forever, right, indefinitely. So the elastic material must obey Hooke's law, right, which we know means it needs to be an ideal spring. 
So the restoring spring force must always be proportional to displacement and opposite the direction of displacement. So if we're a little bit rusty with Hooke's law and our spring stuff, you can go back to uh, unit three and take a look at that again, right? Or just quickly, right? The force of a spring, as long as it's an ideal spring that's perfectly elastic, uh, is going to be equal to negative k, which is the spring constant or its stiffness, times x, which is the distance from equilibrium. So here, our equilibrium would be in the middle. All right, I might draw in a nice equilibrium line here. And as we move to the left of equilibrium, the force is going to be directed to the right. And that's why we get our negative sign, because the force is always directed in the opposite direction to displacement. Right, as we push the spring together, the elastic force of the spring will be wanting to push it back to equilibrium. As we're stretching it, it's going to want to pull it back to equilibrium. You can imagine yourself physically holding a spring, stretching it, and you would uh, anticipate those forces in those directions. All right, and here, x is our distance from equilibrium, right, shown here. Right, from uh Change in x means that we're going from final position minus initial. So we would actually have uh, a negative displacement here if we're using left as negative, right as positive. And we'd have a positive displacement here. So this is a little bit of review. So we have a mass m attached to a horizontal spring sliding on a frictionless surface. Uh, the review part would be that when it's at the center, it's going with a speed of zero, and it has its maximum acceleration, sorry, not when it's at the center, when it's at rest at the end. So it has maximum acceleration, maximum force, zero velocity. So uh, once it reaches equilibrium, that's when it's traveling the fastest, right? Just like a pendulum traveling through the center equilibrium port has its maximum speed at the bottom. So this is actually analogous to a pendulum as well. And then again, once it reaches the maximum extension of the spring, we're going to be at zero. And again, the maximum acceleration with the force and the acceleration both in the opposite direction as this starting point. All right, this is a lot to take in in one little lesson. So I hope you're doing okay with this. Uh, might be wise to go back, look through your notes on our springs. Maybe watch that video again. Uh, but if you're doing good with it, let's keep going. So maximum acceleration, again, unit three dynamic stuff. This is principle of physics one, Newton's second law. The net force is equal to the mass of the spring, or sorry, the mass of our object times acceleration. So we can solve for this acceleration, right? with some quick algebra dividing both sides by m. And our only force acting on it is the force of the spring, assuming we're on a frictionless surface. And we know that the force of the spring is equal to k times x and negative for that opposite direction to the displacement divided by mass. And let's try our first example of unit six together. We have a 350 gram cart attached to a spring. So I'll draw my spring in here. So there's my cart or frictionless box, however you want to think about it. It only weighs 0.35 kilograms. And it's going to be undergoing simple harmonic motion. So it's going to go from this extension to equilibrium to compression, right? Back and forth, right? Keep oscillating, keep almost vibrating or uh, yeah, undergoing this movement back and forth. So those are kind of my three scenarios. Here's my equilibrium. I'll call that EQM. 
for short equilibrium. So it has a maximum acceleration of 680 centimeters per second squared. So I can right away switch that from centimeters per second squared to meters by second squared by either using a unit conversion fraction, right? So I know that I have one meter per 100 centimeters. So I'll just divide this number by 100 and I get 6.8 meters per second squared. There we go, standard units, that's nice. So if the minimum length of the spring is 14.2 centimeters, so minimum is gonna occur here. So that's 0 0.142 meters. And the maximum length is 27.4, so that's going to be up here. 0 0.274 meters. We want to determine the spring constant, K. K. So we want to use this information about the spring length, first of all, to find our amplitude, right? That's going to be our change in X or our amplitude in both directions. So first step, we're going to find amplitude. And this is just gonna re require some easy math and reading of our diagram. So if our maximum is 27.4 and our minimum is 1.4, right? And we look at how that's affecting the amplitude, right? To go from this maximum point to equilibrium is gonna be our amplitude one, right? That's our first amplitude. Then we need to go from equilibrium to the maximum compression. So we have a second amplitude or second delta x, right? Change in displacement from equilibrium. So if we go, we could start here, let's say. Our length is 0 0.142 meters. We're gonna travel our delta x. We're gonna travel delta x again. So we have two delta x and we're ending up at 0.274. So mathematically, that's gonna look like this. We've got 0 0.142 meters, we're starting here, plus two of our amplitudes leaves us at 0 0.274 meters. All right, we want to know the amplitude. We're gonna do some rearranging for that. We're going to subtract 0.14 from both sides. And we're going to divide by 2. So we're going to get 0 0.274 minus 0 0.142 divided by 2, giving us uh, 0 0.066 meters. That's our amplitude. That's all with the question once. We want to find k. So if we remember. Our acceleration is our spring force divided by our mass. This is our equation that we created. We get negative kx over m is equal to acceleration. Now we're trying to solve for k. So do a little bit of rearranging with this. We're going to multiply both sides by m. Kind of ignore that. And we're going to divide both sides by negative x. So I'm getting rid of my negative sign, left with positive k. So I have k by itself is equal to negative acceleration mass divided by x, or my amplitude. So we're given a maximum acceleration of 6.8 meters per second squared. We're given a mass of 0.35 kilograms. 
and a change in amplitude or a change in displacement of 0 0.066 meters. Where did our negative go? Well, k constant should technically be positive. So that negative uh, was in reference to this amplitude. So if we're actually looking at the negative amplitude, that'll cancel it out. Right? We don't need a negative k, so we won't use one. Instead, we're given 36.1 newtons per meter as our final answer. Right, 6.8 times 0.35 divided by 0 0.066 gives us 36.1 newtons per meter. There's our first one. We're not done yet. We're looking at vertical springs now. So we just looked at a horizontal spring, which is easy as long as it's on a friction in the surface. The only force acting on it is the force of the spring. But what's going to change when we're looking at vertical? we now have gravity to think about. So if a mass is hanging or attached to a vertical spring, uh, when it's not actually moving, when it's just suspended and sitting there at this stretched out point, we know the distance it's stretched from where it started. Since it's not moving, we're gonna use Newton's first law, right? This is only when it's not moving I don't like writing like that. So anything that's not moving, we're going to use Newton's first law for. Uh, with Newton's first law, right, the net force has to be zero. So the force on the spring up has to be equal to the force of gravity down. They have to cancel each other out. So our net force is zero. So force of the spring is going to be negative kx or kx in this case uh, equals mass times gravity right because gravity is technically force of gravity should be down right kx should be up our signs cancel each other out there so a force is applied so this is going to be a good way for us to solve for k right if we know the mass of the object and how much it's stretched it's going to be an easy way for us to solve for the spring constant because gravity on earth is a constant the mass usually will be given right technically we could solve for any one of those three variables as long as we're given the other two so let's keep going a force is then applied to cause the system to undergo simple harmonic motion so it's starting at this equilibrium point right that's right here we're going to pull it down we're going to stretch it even further so we're maintaining the same force of gravity throughout this hopefully you can see that these arrows these uh, force vectors are all the same length because gravity is constant throughout this motion when it's at its furthest point from equilibrium or its maximum extension we have the longest spring force when it's at equilibrium again they're equal. When it's at the top, we remember our spring force is always in the opposite direction to our displacement. So if displacement is up, spring force will be down. So we actually have force of gravity and the spring force in the same direction. Here again at equilibrium, they are going to cancel out. And at the bottom, when we've undergone one full oscillation, one full cycle, we're going to have our maximum spring force up right equals gravity force down and just like with our horizontal spring we have these situations occurring when it's at the bottom we have maximum acceleration because we have a maximum net force when it's at the middle we have zero acceleration because our forces cancel but we have a maximum speed right either up or down it can be shown that the maximum acceleration formula is the same as the one for simple harmonic motion in a horizontal direction. Right? If we uh, used our net force, right, our gravities would actually cancel out because we have a force of gravity on each of them. I'm not going to show it here. That will take up too much of your valuable time.
just uh, if you're curious you can try to do the same steps that we did for horizontal uh, for the vertical and you'll end up with this same formula so these uh, examples are going to be a little bit more complicated because we're throwing gravity into it uh, but here's our final example for lesson one we have a vertical spring they're giving us a rest length so I'll draw it out at rest the spring is going to be 30 centimeters 0 0.3 meters when we attach 200 gram mass uh, we get a new length so this is our 0.2 kilograms and our new length is going to be 0 0.385 meters. So we've stretched an extra 8.5 centimeters. So it's then going to undergo simple harmonic motion with a maximum acceleration of 29 meters per second squared. We want to determine the new minimum length. So our formula that is given that we just solve for in both horizontal and well we were given in the vertical of this requires us to know the k constant the question's not telling us that we're gonna have to solve that on our own uh, so we need this because the real reason we're here for this question is to determine our amplitude right we're looking for this point where our spring is at its maximum compression and the new minimum length so that's what we're looking for that new length as it's going under undergoing simple harmonic motion so we know acceleration we have to find our spring constant that's gonna be our first step and once we've discovered our spring constant we're going to be ready uh, to solve for the amplitude and with the amplitude we'll be able to solve for that minimum length all right so determining spring constant we're going to need to look at this guy uh, between here and here so we have a force of the spring acting up and a force of gravity acting down right this is a snapshot a free body diagram of it when it's at rest right with the mass suspended on it so here we've stretched a distance of x so what is our x value it's going to be our final minus initial 0.385 meters minus 0.3 meters giving us 0 0.085 meters or 8.5 centimeters of stretch from equilibrium or rest length to its new displacement so we're going to use our principle of physics zero net force is zero because it's not moving yet it's not undergoing simple harmonic motion We've just stretched it out, let it sit there, so it's not bouncing up and down at all. No acceleration, no force. So if F net is zero, we know that our spring force in the upwards direction minus force of gravity is zero. So we can rearrange that. Spring force is equal to force of gravity. Kx is equal to mass times gravity we're gonna solve for K so our spring constant is equal to mass times gravity divided by our displacement from equilibrium you're gonna be using this a lot over the next little bit so hopefully you can get familiar with it and our way of uh, working with Newton's first law and our uh, net force equaling zero right 
force of spring, force of gravity, solving for spring constant. So mass was 0.2 kilograms. Gravity is always 9.81 on Earth. And x is 0 0.085 meters. That's how far it stretched from before the mass was attached to when the mass is attached and it's, uh, again, stretched out but at rest. So our k is equal to 23.08 newtons per meter. All right, our reference for this up was positive, down was negative. We have k. Now we're going to solve for our amplitude. That's going to be our next step. Determine amplitude. So we have our formula. We're going to rearrange it to solve for our amplitude or change in displacement. So multiply both sides by m, divide both sides by k. And we get uh, 0 0.2 times acceleration, uh, which the question gives us, yes, as 29 meters per second squared. I didn't write that down, but it was given in the question. 29 meters per second squared divided by our k constant that we just solved for 23.08 newtons per meter All right and if we I want to double check we're not so sure about our formula we can actually do some unit cancellation right so a newton uh, is a measurement of force which is mass times acceleration so this would be kilograms this would be meters per second squared so mass acceleration, mass acceleration, they're going to cancel out, and we're left with 1 over meters on our denominator. So we're actually ending up with displacement in meters, which is perfect. That's what we want. And that displacement is 0 0.251 meters. So our amplitude, right, once we're, this is actually when we're, accelerating up and down so from here we're going to be bouncing down these 25 centimeters and we're going to go up these 25.1 centimeters so this is going to require a bit of drawing and figuring out to determine our minimum length So we're going through this uniform circular motion. We're going to be having this minimum, which is what we're looking for. We're going to be having this equilibrium, which we know is 0.385 meters. And we're going to have this maximum extension which is going to be 0.385 plus our amplitude. So from equilibrium to this minimum point, we're traveling that distance of our amplitude. From equilibrium to our maximum point, we're also traveling that same distance, that same amplitude, which we just solved for. So if we're looking for the minimum length, our minimum length, is what we're looking for. We're going to have uh, a total length L uh, which is going to be equal to our minimum which is what we're looking for yeah is that going to be the easiest way to do it Sure. We've got 30 when it's at rest. Right, so before even this 
we have 30 at rest. I don't really like this way of doing it. I'm going to do it a different way. This is the way they did it on the solutions manual. But instead, I'm going to start with this 38.5. 0 0.385 minus our amplitude is equal to our minimum length, which is what we're looking for. So 0 0.385 minus 0 0.251 gives us our minimum. So our minimum length is equal to 0. 0, 0.0636. Let me double check that. We're actually getting one, three, four. Hmm. All right, this is how the solution manual is solving it. We have our length. This length L is equal to our original starting spring 30 centimeters plus our extension when we add the spring which we used up here of 0 0.085 plus our amplitude 0 0.251 oh we're finding the maximum length here okay that makes sense so the solutions are solving for maximum. If you want to solve minimum, right, we're going to use the extended length minus the amplitude, which was 0 0.134. But the maximum length, just in case you wanted to know, is going to be 0 0.636 meters. A little bit of confusion. Sorry about that. The uh, solution manual was solving for uh, what I assume was an old question, but the minimum length is how I solved before. Maximum is adding all of them together. All right, good luck with the homework. I will get you a second and much shorter video 